for the flow of the conversation this morning. We have a couple of key questions that we hope to address to our panelists and see where their thoughts and expertise have been walking the walk of this space for some years. Then we have a Q&A box and we've a chat box for our audience to participate and um, get a conversation going around this area. We have um, just under the hour to try and cover as much as we can. We're, it's our second in our master series. We're going to so um, I'm a business psychologist and I specialize in neurodiversity, um, which for those of you who don't know is um, usually conditions like dyslexia, ADHD, autism and Asperger's um, and what we found is that the digital transformation um, really creates a more level playing field for people with those conditions and the way the work environment is being shaped at the moment it's really important that we get that right for fairness. Thanks Charlie. I might go to you next Jackie. Sure, thanks Gronia. So my name is Jackie Gilmore. Good afternoon everybody. Delighted to be here. I'm a partner with EY in the area of People Advisory Services and I focus on organisation transformation and talent and to that end uh, the future of work. And more recently in the last three to four months uh, return to work and how we're reimagining that um, in the wake of COVID-19 as well. So uh, I work across um, financial services and the private sector and would be delighted to uh, share any any insights and thoughts this afternoon. Thanks, Jackie. And finally, Brian. Good afternoon, Gronje, and thank you, uh, thank you, UCC. Thank you for the opportunity. It's lovely to uh, lovely to contribute. Um, so I work with uh, HSBC, um, based out of London. Well, I would be based out of London if I if I could make it there. I've started actually during COVID, incidentally, so working from home. Um, I'm looking at the future operating model for data and analytics for the uh, HSBC business for the, the commercial bank and the, and the global bank. Um, my background is, is transformation and, and change and, uh, you know, adding, looking for how we sort of challenge norms and challenge the status quo and drive value uh, and really putting the customer as a North Star and all of that. So hopefully I can contribute a few insights. Great, Brian. Thanks a lot. And start with a first question, and maybe I could address it to you three. Um, COVID-19 has brought a lot, and we've seen, as Jackie had just mentioned, the returning of workforce. Just a couple of months ago, we had nearly a dead stop of people exiting the workplaces and trying a whole new fit at working from home. So the question um, kicks off at how different do you feel the workforce and workplace of the future will be, should we say, in five years' time? And what are some of the things we need to look out for in moving forward in the new future of work? Jackie, I might shoot with you to start with, if that's okay. Sure, Gronia, and uh, thanks a lot. It's a great question, and um, I, I'm not sure everybody re uh, really has the answer to that because um, there is um, there are kind of a, a lot of a lot of unknowns which we've uh, seen evidenced uh, by the pace of acceleration that's come on the wake of COVID-19. But um, certainly, we, what we do know is that the future of work is um, is is going to be very different, and that's kind of it's coming from the a concept to kind of realization now for many organisations. If, if we look at you know, since 2000, over 52% of Fortune 500 organizations uh, no longer exist. Uh, we're now at over 50% uh, global um, internet penetration. And we know that our, that employees are motivated by purpose. And more recently, the new, um, you know, the new keyword of kind of biosecurity as well, and um, how the employees, or so how employers uh, respond to their biosecure needs and the societal impact of that for organizations as a whole. So, as a whole, so certainly, you know, when we look ahead, we know that in the next 10 years, there's going to be almost 500 million. Um, you know, working additions to the working population, and um, and they will have different needs. And um, you know, there are kind of suggestions that some of those will most likely, many of those will most likely um, quit a role due to say substandard um, technology. So that's certainly a role to play. So I would categorise how that's going to change into four different buckets, and really looking at kind of what the nature of the work will be um, in the future, um, to what extent that is structured. So um, Brian mentioned 
mentioned operating model. So what does that operating model of the future look like um, as we move from hierarchy to network of teams? Um, how is that uh, work enabled? So the overlap um, between technology and human and that human augmentation and how that's best leveraged um, to serve businesses, societies and customers. And then finally, how that's felt. So that kind of CX, EX, that a customer experience, employee experience and employee value proposition coming into the fore and the combination of those. Well, there's a, a lot of new terminology already being buzzed um, at us this morning. Um, and Brian, can you follow through on, on sure. your thoughts and where you're at for Thank you. Yeah, sure. I mean, uh, some of the things Jackie's already said are echoing straight away with me, and things I I, I would have I, I would be saying as well. Uh, I think probably if we wind back a little bit and uh, kind of what journey are we on over a kind of a long period of time? And Jackie mentioned, uh, you know, employee experience, customer experience. I think it's it was about ten years ago that it, the the penny dropped for us that we weren't treating our customers particularly well, and the kind of customer experience came into vogue and and experiential. You know, and how you design so with the with the customer in mind, and that was almost a new thing at the time. We'd lost sight of that. I think that kind of brought us into a space of uh, employee experience, where we realised an engaged employee was really was going to change the dial when it came to customer experience. So, seeing those two things together was starting to was, was part of the journey that we're on. I think where that's leading us now is into actually bringing that into a, a team environment, and uh, and and a, when by team we mean multidisciplinary, where we bring our collective brain together to, to solve problems. So I think fundamentally, the way we go about solving our problems or opening up our opportunities is, is a completely different way of thinking. And we break things down, we break things down, and you know we're all probably very familiar with the likes of Agile and working in frameworks and being design-led and really thinking from the business perspective and thinking about the outcome. So I think there's a fundamental shift in, so it's in how we structure ourselves. It's less about what we do. We we'll figure out what we do when we get ourselves in the right in the right construct. Um, I I think, the, in terms of sort of COVID and and the impact, I don't think this is necessarily changing the direction of travel. I think we're on the same direction, but I think there's an acceleration. <clears throat> so the government last year um, issued a, a future of jobs Ireland, and they kind of forecast things for 2025 that needed to change like low carbon, bringing more people into the workforce, embracing technology. In fact, these are all the things that just after happening in the last couple of months. So I, <clears throat> I'd argue that we've accelerated. I don't think we've necessarily changed. Um, we, we just, we just, we're getting there a bit faster. And, 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 and there's a lot of good in that because I think that'll make our businesses more resilient and sustainable. Uh, because there was a there was a, a, a there was a sustainability issue there probably in our businesses. They weren't they were fragile and they've proven to be fragile. So we really need to apply, apply our brains to that. So. so lots of key topics there that we could hone in and, and, and spend more hours discussing in, in those fruitful thoughts that you've shared, Brian. Charlie, we'll just go to you for your thoughts on it. Sure. I mean, I think Jackie's right when we say five years, nobody knows. I think five months is quite far in advance to think about. Um, so the, the biggest thing from, from my perspective is that for a long, long time, um, as, as individual psychologists working in neurodiversity, we've been trying to convince managers that they could really benefit from letting some of their neurodiverse workforce work from home sometimes. Um, and we've uh, really battled um, against this idea that they might be shirking. And, and what COVID did was um, it kind of launched this international social experiment and it would seem that we were right all along. People can work from home and it, it's just fine. So I think for me, it's there's something about this dropping the idea of the office as such. And, um, you know, I think it was really important for us all to be in the office when clerks needed to refer to ledgers. Um, but, but going forward, what it means is if, if you need quiet, then you can work at home. If you are someone who likes the zing and um, needs the quick fire stimulation in order to thought, then you can, you can work on the move now. Um, and, and I think Brian as well, it's like you say, it was all happening anyway, but we've kind of had a concentration of this because we've had to think outside of the box in terms of finding new ways of working and, and coping. It's just just making that more. It's just important for me that we just don't go back to these old ways because it's what we used to do. Um, and 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 you know the uh, the digital transformation means that things that we're teaching in schools are already obsolete. So you know my first career was in education, so it pains me to say this, but you know we're not going to need to know how to spell. It's just not going to be relevant. So we're still teaching skills that 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 
just won't be useful and arguably um, spelling isn't necessary now with the voice recognition software that we've got and text to speech so there's something about equipping our young people as well with the flexibility for it and and charlie that's bringing back a subject to me and i'm personally passionate about do you think that we're at all ready to for that education transformation then when you say that we're not at all ready yet we're accelerating and brian is reckoning we're at 2025 and it's only 2020 so what's the bridging gap how do we call out to to our governments to our education centers well, far be it from me to advise on the national <laughs> curriculum. Um, but so, so I think that, you know, we're still very subject and topic based in education. Um, and actually what we need to be doing is equipping young people with, with the skills and the flexibility um, to be ready to, to, to adopt things quicker and, and to change rather than, um, uh, you know, quizzing them on, on history and geography, which are lovely subjects. I'm not against history and geography, but, um, you know, in what reality are our kids learning algebra, but not about pensions? That's, that's really weird, I think. So. Absolutely. Jackie, have you any final thoughts before we move on? And Jackie's um, no, I'd, I'd, I'd certainly kind of share kind of what um, uh, Brian and uh, Charlie have um, have stated, and also kind of when it comes to education and and learning, and you know the the half of life skills, and I suppose the fact that an engineering degree is, or the suggestion that an engineering degree is only kind of valid for eighteen months now, just such as the pace of acceleration. Um, I think there's. Uh, a, again kind of in the wake of COVID as well this is coming more into focus that there's certainly um, a, a requirement more of a requirement or an obligation on behalf of the employer to look at um, how they're tooling and skilling up kind of their workforce and uh, and ensuring that uh, there's that cycle of learning uh, continues over time so um, what, I, what I certainly would uh, say is that there's an opportunity to look at um, uh, ensuring that there's greater levels of experiential learning kind of in, in an organization uh, combined with um, mentoring and, uh, and reverse mentoring and then also kind of on the job learning and um, uh, you know, through their, the accountabilities of their own job profile as well. And it's the, the combination of those three um, and working in this um, uh, also leveraging some of the um, e-learning tools um, which will hopefully uh, ensure that um, in, individuals will will remain relevant and continue to kind of build uh, their knowledge and their skill set and can contribute to the organizations. Great, Jackie, thank you. And Brian? Uh, well, without repeating some of those really good comments, I mean, I think it's really about behaviors now. And it's about you know fostering the skills that help people adapt to new situations. They, you know, apply, their, apply, their, apply themselves in different ways and bring unique talents, um, you know, bring new, unique perspectives to play uh, and developing a culture where people actually can speak up. Um, you know, the ideas can come from anywhere genuinely. And then the whole, uh, uh, you know, the idea of failing fast, it's, it's almost a little bit cliche at this stage, but, it, you know, it's important that you're trying things and experimenting uh, and you're breaking things down into very small and iterating and continuously learning and getting that feedback loop. And, and then, only doing, only pushing ahead when when the conditions are right, and then scaling really fast and being able to hit the market. And, and so these these are the things, and that's, that's a different set of you know that's a whole different set of skills for people that they they and ideally people who are coming from sort of a technical engineering background, if we can kind of fuse some of those skills together and get that questioning, critical thinking mindset into people, it's going to be powerful. Um, you know, apl applied on top of a, some technical skills. Great, Brian, thank you. Um, let's follow through. I'm just seeing on one of the comments we're, we're, tweeting, we're tweeting away, should I say, follow um, hashtag DTFOW, the future of work, along to our, our next question. What will be the long-term impact of COVID-19 on employees, workplaces, and workforces? And what was the most unusual insight or lesson you have learned over the past few months about digital transformation. And let me see who'd like to take that. Maybe Jackie. So it's, um, I think we're, 
I think we're still learning in terms of the long term impact on employees because um, like that, you know, we're still in an evolving situation and we don't know as to what extent there will be a resurgence and the, uh, the extent to which that will um, have an impact um, on individuals kind of in the, in the long term. Um, however, there are a couple of things that, um, you know, that we have seen um, on a sector agnostic um, basis and, um, and come more and more into the fore in the last uh, couple of months. And I suppose kind of one, we, what we've seen is that the, um, we are adaptable, you know, so in the space of a week, the amount of people who've moved over to whatever platform you choose, either be it Zoom, Teams, WebEx or otherwise. So we have been able to adapt very quickly um, to uh, to new technologies and work effectively and product uh, and productively um, in that remote environment. Um, there are some, we would have uh, some uh, insight to suggest that 60% of um, individuals uh, working remotely from home still feel they're as productive as they would have been um, if they were working in the office. And um, we're seeing some kind of really interesting kind of decisions being taken by um, other organizations like the likes of uh, Tata Consulting Services in, the, in India, who've mandated that most of their, that all of their um, employees will re work uh, remotely from home because it delivers, uh, here's another buzzword, Gonya, but a uh, productivity velocity quotient of 25%. So they're saying that there's this sustained kind of uplift in productivity. Um, certainly kind of we're seeing that very much in evidence and then um, also I think there's a, a greater level of focus um, on employee well-being and work-life balance so prior to uh, COVID-19 coming into effect when we look at the future structure of the organization in terms of the the organizational design and spans of layers the impact of technology would have um, reduced um, the requirement for say uh, finance teams administration teams customer service teams but conversely it would have seen an, uh, an increase or an expansion of uh, the C-suite and also um, and and well-being, so that's now been amplified um, even further, and it's also posing um, some really um, important questions uh, for leaders in their organisations around what is the long-term value that um, they are going to um, hold themselves to account for beyond the key financial levers of the PNL, <coughs> and how are they kind of realising that um, in their throughout the organisation and in the market. Uh, so they would be kind of just some of the um, some of the uh, er early insights on the impact on employees. And and do you think, Jackie, that a, a whole new area of training? Do you feel that many companies are ready for this? That they have the training and the intelligence in house to deliver this up speed and transformation? Or do you think that's a new form that we'll have to move to in in getting them ready or getting them digitally enabled, if you like? I think most of the organizations, uh, most kind of large scale enterprise blue chip um, organizations would have um, learning management systems um, in place and it's a, it's a case of evolving or building on them. Um, but, you know, we're also talking about, um, you know, the development of soft skills and that becoming more important and those soft skills, as, as I keep saying, being the hard skills now as we go forward. And quite often, like we see kind of mid, middle management layers who I refer to as the forgotten middle because um, um, they're, they don't necessarily kind of benefit kind of a full kind of suite or glide path of, um, of learning development or leadership development um, programs. And now as a result of COVID-19, more than ever, it's really... I believe it's really important for um, or, for organisations and their leaders um, to have those uh, those soft skills to uh, invest in in their in their management, um, and then so as they can have um, very candid conversations um, on a one to one basis with employees who might be coming back to work, and to understand their intrinsic motivations and how best to respond to them and create the conditions that are successful to enable them to work productively and feel safe and secure. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Jackie. Brian. Um, so I suppose location, our location of work is, is, is become a question now. We've, we were always suspicious about working from home. Um, and I think that we've slayed that dragon. I think Charlie already mentioned that. But I think it's, it's probably worth thinking about for the future. Where we are really has to be dictated by what we're trying to achieve. Um, and again, Charlie did mention, you know, wherever you have that, whatever that right space is, I'd sort of, I contend that, you know, home is part of a hybrid model. 
you know, home suits, obviously at home, it suits a work, um, a work life balance and, and other, there's other benefits to it, but it's probably very, very good for concentrated work. It's probably very good for productivity as we probably we're, we're going to discover. But then let's not forget probably the benefit of what the, the, the office, the commute. So it's about understanding where we get benefit in different ways. And the office is about probably sharing knowledge, about passing knowledge to younger colleagues, about like, you know, creating some sort of level of community and, and social interaction about forming those connections and kind of resetting and all. I'd, I'd offer something else to the mix here. Is it, I'd, I'd call it a third space. Uh, what's your creative space? It might be one of those two things because I think in a, in a world where we're becoming more uh, connected through ecosystems and we're collaborating more, there's potentially a third space. It doesn't necessarily need to be a, a, a particular place, but it may be a customer location or a, a partner location or a satellite office or a coffee shop or whatever it happens to be. But think, I think people need to think about that in the mix. Where do I, where do I create best? Where, do, where am I at my best? And, and allocate a, a, you know, a certain amount of time to that. Um, just as sort of in terms of the longer term, I, I've got some research here. Uh, there's a HSBC has issued something yesterday. It's on the website, actually. You can download it. It's uh, Resilience Building Back Better. And it's, it's a feedback from uh, March, April period of this year from 2,600 customers about how they're feeling on COVID. And it, meet, it, it, it reads very interestingly in terms of, you know, um, you know, the long-term impacts is tech and sustainability need to be ingrained more into how companies operate, resilience. But something that's coming to the top, which is very interesting, is that um, uh, customers are customers of HSBC feel more connected to their customers, 82%, to their employees, 83%, and to strategic partners, 80%. So there is definitely, it, this has bonded, um, you know, ecosystems, supply chains, call it what you will. I had an anecdote yesterday from somebody I was working with in another company and I asked him, I said, business must be difficult or constrained or major services provider. He said, it's incredible the empathy that he that, that, that has been developed with our customers. So it's, you know, people, because everybody's in this together. Uh, so in terms of the long term, maybe there's some, as well as the structural things around sustainability and, and resilience, maybe there's an empathy factor here. Maybe there's a closeness here and, and, and a reimagining as to about the way we need to go forward. So I'd like to think that there's a very strong byproduct coming, but all to be seen, I suppose, over time. All very positive, Brian. Thanks for that. And Charlie, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, um, it's quite a specific thing for me. So um, as I mentioned, my um, area of specialism is neurodiversity and um, I guess the easiest way of explaining that is that um, some people have um, greater strengths and weaknesses across their cognitive profile. Um, and I personally go in, diagnose and make recommendations to help with weaker areas. And then we make sure that people um, with a specific strengths are in the right jobs. Um, they can be lifelong conditions, but um, we also talk about acquired neurodiversity. So um, let's say for argument's sake that um, someone is undergoing chemotherapy, we might find that um, whilst they're on treatment, um, their working memory isn't as strong as it would be normally, or they might not process as quickly. And what we're finding with COVID is um, people are having longer term problems with working memory and processing speed. Um, and we just don't know what the implication is of that yet. So we don't know of all of the people who have had COVID, some, it would seem that some people keep getting recurring symptoms, they're very tired, they feel better and then they get worse again. I actually have a colleague who tested positive for the first um, test and the second test, then tested negative and then tested positive again on the fourth test. And it's really concerning because obviously we don't know what implications um, there are going forward but what we do know is that some colleagues will need extra support of course that's going to have an impact on teams um, and the most important thing is that we talk about it and it doesn't become one of those things that we just make quiet and and go away because it's going to put disproportionate amount of stress on certain people so very specific answer to your question but it's quite an important thing I think. Absolutely Charlie and thanks for that and I suppose 
often that's not really spoken about? Is it a layer underneath the carpet that seems to be pushed away or, or not consciously, maybe subconsciously, we are dealing with it, but it's over here um, and we have support mechanisms. Um, but yet in, in forums like this, it's great to have it and have you on board today to address that and, and to make it a very key point of going forward that there's lots of employees and employers out there that are in such new territory of something that is not just the winter flu, this is something that, that may have recurring effects and where is that going to impact the progression of employees, et cetera, in work, not to mention their, their mental state should they return to the office or not. So, so indeed, lots of food for thought and, and a, a very great area that lots more of support needs to come I'd imagine that both, both in the UK and Ireland. So hopefully we can learn from your intelligence in that space. Um, I've just received two questions and I might, the first one is a little lengthy, so bear with me and, and I'd appreciate if, if there's hands up uh, who wants to tackle it. But Alan, thanks for sharing. Facebook announced in May that up to half its workforce is likely to be working from home within the next five to 10 years. There is one caveat, staff salaries could be adjusted to align with the cost of living in their chosen location, meaning potential pay cuts for those considering moving away from its expensive Palo Alto and other global hubs like Dublin. Does this mean there potentially will be a job, a job drain out of Ireland to lower cost economies? I might let that sink in for a couple of seconds. <laughs> the um, I, I I think it definitely. I, I would say that that's uh, you know I, I that makes a lot of sense um, for me. Um, you know, in terms of if, if we continue on the track of we were when we spoke earlier about you know employee engagement and really engaged employees and and people being at their best and in their most uncomfortable environment, it, and and what's happening this you know you know incorporating your home wherever your home is into the whole equation seems to be a logical next step. So you would expect um, where people are flocking to the city and to the jobs. I mean, cities, I suppose, are under threat as well in this, in this, there's a lot of, you know, evidence or anecdotal evidence at this point that cities could suffer. Um, you know, we didn't think that was going to happen. Nobody would have forecast that. So being needing to be in the city at the hub in in a location doesn't seem like it's as important as it was 12 mon months ago. Um, so, uh, and I could see, I could see why people would, 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 would look to reduce their salary and, and have a, a, a better way of life and a cheaper way of life and a, and a, and a, a home working environment. So I think that's, a, I, I think, I think we'd have to take that as a threat in terms of our workforce for the future. Uh, particularly with particular types of skill sets that lend themselves to being remote anyway, which are, a lot of key skills that we're going to need. And in my own area, we're looking at that very intensively where our skills are going to come from. Okay, thanks for that, Brian. Jackie, have you any thoughts? Um, no, I'd, I'd share uh, Brian's perspective on, on that question. Um, I'd probably also add to say that I think that this is a much bigger, it's one of the big hairy kind of challenges that are coming from a socio-political perspective as well. So, um, you know, to what extent does, um, the employer, if, if we consider it that we've got kind of a number of US, MNs, US multinationals in Ireland and um, say if we take kind of uh, one of the, the top three and over 80% of their workforce are non-nationals, many of whom have returned to their home jurisdiction um, and are now working from home, there is a question around employer's liability and uh, where that starts and stops and at what point will that um, overtake the you know, apparent benevolence, the current benevolence of those organisations. So what does that mean then effectively from a cost and also from a taxation perspective uh, for those organisations operating here in Ireland? And that's a hot topic and it's one for government. And so that the person hit the nail on the head. So thank, thanks for that, Jackie. Absolutely. So maybe not just a job drain, but a, a whole mm -hmm. bunch of economic factors and and legal factors and um, you know employees to look out for that and and seek good advice and and uh, before they go forward absolutely charlie are, are will you have that effect in the uk or are more people no, coming home to ireland 
Good grief. The idea of being paid less depending on geographical location. I'm not sure I can get on with that. Um, and, you know, I guess what, what also comes up for me is, uh, you know, where do you draw the line there? So are we also going to, um, do you know, one of the things that, obs that concerns me the most about the digital transformation is this obsession over seeing when people are logged on. So I shall not name and shame any large companies, but it would seem that as a matter of um, just general process, it states how long people are logged on for, when they've logged in, when they've logged off. And what that doesn't tell you is whether they've actually done any real work. Um, and so for me, it's actually about judging people by their output and not on their input and geographic location oh that's a hot topic isn't it you know so London waiting fine and we don't really want people to be in the city so we're going to penalize them financially for getting out of the cities that seems odd to me but maybe I don't know enough about life in Dublin to to say any more about that we we look forward to welcome you there as as the first key invitation or better still to Cork uh, yeah uh, okay guys I have another question in um from Eric the substantial increase in virtual remote working has accelerated quickly, but what was withholding companies earlier to experiment and accelerate her? Brian, you've talked a lot about accelerating. Will I hit yeah. you with that one? Yeah. Fine. Well, I mean, technology was definitely a, a constraint. Um, I mean, it's probably surprised us all how, how technology was just ready um, for this. I'm not sure 12 months ago, uh, even it would have been we would have been able to flex to do what we've done so um i do think and and, and uh, kind of echoing charlie's last comment there about you know are you online presenteeism and old-fashioned mentalities towards has definitely been there's been a huge suspicion uh, to home working uh, you know that you couldn't actually contribute and be productive and um and i think that's i think so i i probably just some and, and and maybe we just haven't advanced our whole discussion about what work is, you know. Um, you know, it's it's changed. It's dramatically changed. Uh, digital transformation. The, the digital lab will 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 tell us this. But the way the way we're now looking at the future of our businesses is we're kind of assembling them in very small parts. We're using you know microservices and APIs, and we're breaking it down. And we're building it up, and it's more organic. So. It's a different type of work is a, a different type of thing. So I just don't think we had brought our thinking forward enough. We were still in that ritual of getting in our cars and going to the office and then figuring out what we're going to do. So it probably needed that bigger debate. Um, and this is the catalyst, I, I, I perhaps for that. Jackie, you're, you're nodding there graciously. <laughs> yeah, no, I would, um, when I look at it, I actually think that a lot of it is down to kind of behaviours. And, you know, when I look at, um, you know, why change programmes, you know, and large scale transformation programmes change kind of over, uh, it's quite a significant percentage of that is down to corporate disobedience and, um, and also maybe kind of a, a lack of kind of change management and behavioural change to support that. So I think in this instance, kind of what we've seen is that a unifying common goal you know so um there's a burning platform there globally uh, that nobody could challenge um you know for um you know for the want of kind of keep, keeping economies people and um and uh, life going um during this period and so therefore i think that kind of really kind of did away with that corporate disobedience and and even you know you could see that kind of very much um in in practice um at a local irish level and um, because i suppose we were at a at, once the kind of pan pandemic ensued, um, we were still uh, at a point where our own government was in formation talks. And who would have thought that we would have seen this, uh, you know, a very kind of uh, different um, government that we have now um, oh, six months ago. So I think kind of that has all, that has all helped, that burning platform. It's done away with the corporate um, disobedience, disobedience. And um, it's also encouraged organisations um, where they may not have trusted their employees to work remotely in the past and be productive and kind of doing all the right things it's forced that and um, and then in doing so they've kind of seen that um, people can be productive and it's built up that environment of uh, psychological trust as well great thanks jackie absolutely and i think the trust factor is something that 
it was there, I suppose. Did it need to be tested? Um, you know, and then was it driven into it? exponential testing overnight when, when one has no choice, you've got to go with it and, um, and lots of learnings from that space. Um, Charlie, have you anything to add? Uh, just that if anybody on this webinar is interested in how to get around that system, apparently you can download an app called Jiggle My Mouse. So it looks like you're constantly out. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Charlie, thanks for that. <laughs> we might post it. Indeed. Always good. Guys, I'll move on to um, one of our third questions. We're, we're, how can digital transformation play a positive role in promoting diversity, inclusivity and equitability? Charlie, there's the big <laughs> smile of the day. You couldn't wait to get in on that. <laughs> this area, let's go. Um, so I guess kind of, as I've already said, the big losers will be the people that aren't given that flexibility. So the people who still need to commute into work, the people who um, have to be in the office, open plan offices in particular, so difficult to work in that kind of environment. Um, and I, I think there's also something about the power with a little p and um, the obligation of, of certain people who will have to go on public transport and they might not want to but in order to stay in employment they will um how well are organizations dealing with it and i think it depends it depends on the organization and it depends on openness um but the digital transformation is the big leveler here so I think that the most important thing is that employers need to ensure that their employees have the tools to actually learn how to use some of the, the these digital, um, well, uh, digital uh, tools for what the word, um, because it's all very well equipping people with things, but if they're not shown properly how to use it, it's a bit like being given the car to the Ferrari when you've never driven before, and we can't assume that everybody's just going to plug and go. Great, thanks, Charlie. Jackie, um, and I, I'd, I'd agree with Charlie. I think that those the organisations who are going to lose are those who don't adapt so and and adapt quickly. Um, that's for sure. And you know, even if we when we consider, you know, all of the various kind of research that's out there on you know on how many kind of jobs will be lost and kind of replaced um, with um, you know with with machines. There's a lot of conjecture out there, but I mean, based on our research, we've seen that, you know, let's say in EY, um, uh, New Zealand and Australia that 11% of kind of the jobs that would be um, uh, re retired or jettisoned um, would be re kind of replaced by 13% kind of more kind of roles or more jobs, um, but uh, they would be in very different areas. And I think it's incumbent um, on organisations um, to really look at um, the diversity of skills and kind of diversity of capabilities and um, and really kind of zoning in and kind of some uh, key competencies that may not have been um, uh, given the same attention as uh, as might have been a number of years ago, such as the appreciation of um, intercultural nuance, uh, intercultural kind of appreciation, um, data visualization, um, active learning, team working, uh, critical thinking, uh, statistical reasoning, all of those type of areas. So I think that um, you know if the organisations who embrace the, that and um, and then kind of really kind of interweave and stitch that into um, into their their functions their businesses um, will do well and um, in in terms of how you know this digital transformation will play a positive role I think if anything it's shown is that um, you know there's it's allowed increase in flexibility and no one size fits all that's something that we know for sure so the flexibility wins um, hands down and that kind of in doing so as well, that will encourage um, any type of invisible barriers around engaging different parts of talent in the workforce to be overcome. So those individuals who might have um, uh, caring needs uh, themselves at home um, or those individuals who uh, can't pay rent in certain capitals in Europe um, so therefore they've kind of ruled themselves out of the out of the running for a role and um, they all of a sudden they're back in the frame for that so I think that uh, that's also a contributing factor. Absolutely and interesting I've recently worked with some graduates from both UCC and CIT here in Cork 
and their idea of working from home, you know, in 2020, I'm sure when they started out four years ago was never an intention. Their intention was to get out of home and, uh, and do their college. They were fortunate to stay at home for many of them that could stay at home. And now, you know, when I'm, I'm sitting with them or Zooming with them and they're thinking, the only place is remaining at home. Fine. Thank you. Uh, maybe just just one or two add, uh, points I'd add to that uh, in terms of the losers. Um, companies that uh, and, and individuals, I suppose, who don't work at enough pace um, is very important. I think what we've proven here in the last in the last period of time is would have taken enormous change programs to get everybody working on new technology platforms, but it just happened through osmosis uh, over the last couple of months. Needs must, uh, which proves the point. Uh, you know that people just it's a mindset thing, and as much. So I think pace is now a huge factor in, in, uh, in everything we do. Uh, second thing I'd say is uh, disrupting ourselves and we, uh, automation was mentioned there, but it's very important. I mean, that's the efficiency and the sustainability of our business to get them as lean and mean. So disrupt yourself and disrupt ourselves and get out of your silos. I mean, there's still silos in organizations. Uh, and you know, looking at the politics and, and the right thing is the right thing. We need to we need to get up above our silos and, and, and make good sound decisions based upon design and architecture. Um, last point I'd say is uh, companies that don't don't embrace an ecosystem. Uh, you know, there's so much power outside your own door. You need people. Uh, you need people who are engaged in orchestrating an ecosystem so that we know you know how to tap into it you know how to use it you know how to partner with it um so that you, you find effective ways of partnering in different all different modes there's, there's many 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 different ways you can do this but i think that'll be a limiting factor if people stay within their own four walls and don't embrace uh, the opportunity that's out there Great, Brian, absolutely. So it's all about embracing and moving forward and, and stop, I suppose, slowing down what we did in the past. It's all about um, creativity and critical thinking, design thinking, you know, get this into the boardroom and get them out into spaces. I loved that creative space you mentioned earlier, Brian. Asking, a lot of emphasis is being placed on the transition to digital in the workplace and how changes which are being made now will probably endure long term. What about the third level education space and what would you say that the benefits being felt in the corporate world would be transferable to third level? Don't be shy, guys. <laughs> I think um, maybe if I just, um, I suppose you mentioned earlier there, Gonya, that, uh, you know, around kind of graduates and, you know, the graduate program, you know, from an EY perspective, the graduate program is really important to us. And, um, you know, for the first year, kind of in many, um, we've been kind of uh, challenged with our summer internship program, which is um, in the, just taken place over the last two weeks uh, to really kind of make that kind of meaningful within a virtual environment. And um, and one of, one of the things that we're speaking to um, uh, third level um, institutions on is around um, how to, where we have a focus on uh, digital transformation, on emerging technologies, on data analytics, intelligent automation, and kind of going up that, um, uh, going up that spectrum. Uh, to cognitive and beyond, um, that's a real opportunity for us um, to um, kind of partner and work with um, work with universities um, on their particular kind of business programs um, to kind of bring that bring that to life. So, um, and by that, what I mean is um, just bringing by way of looking at say a, a proof of concepts or by way of um, looking at kind of what our co-creation innovation hubs look like and how we can kind of um, how we can showcase and, and demonstrate maybe some of the uh, technology tooling and uh, ideation and methodologies around kind of uh, getting to a point where you can come up with a really really fantastic um, solution, um, um, either kind of a technology solution or otherwise. And um, to that end, like there's a uh, some of those co-creation, the EY kind of co-creation kind of labs called a wave space. And um, I think that's a real opportunity to look at, uh, take those uh, uh, tooling approaches, methods, and um, plug them in or not, or certainly share them and share that knowledge and kind of bring kind of some of the, um, those kind of um, EY technology leaders or others into um, the third level kind of institutions um, so that, um, so that students can kind of really get a bird's eye view of what that looks like in practice and what they can expect. 
Um, and just finally, we have a question from Natalie. Um, my question was, what about the other side of the spectrum? Employees that are happy and in fact, were looking forward to return back to the office for the social aspect of work and team building. Do you feel that these voices are a minority? I don't mind taking that briefly. Great, Charlie, uh, thanks. I don't know that they're a minority because I can't give you the data to back that up. But what I would say is um, a lot of people actually need the stimulation purely on dopamine levels. Uh, and for some people, it's essential. So if you have ADHD, then it, it's um, quite often accompanied by a lack of dopamine. Um, and yes, absolutely, there'll be people who are dismayed that we're not returning back to the office. Um, and that there's got to be something about um, meeting everybody's needs in that. So yeah, Zoom fatigue is, is quite a big problem, I think. Um, but it's making sure that we get the balance so that people who do need that interaction can have that in various formats, but it, it, it doesn't exclude people who need to be home-based as well. Um, what, what would your three messages be from, from this morning's chat and interactive? We've, we've brought you together and um, you've, you've met um, and, and shared quite a lot of content in the short term. What would you be saying to, to all our viewers and those indeed who, who are looking forward to listening to our recording? Brian. Um, I think the, the digital transformation journey that we've been on for, you know, for a number of years, I think we just need to stay the course on that. This this doesn't change it. It just it just it just brings it into sharper and sharper focus, and probably changes it to a degree. But but it's still the same. We still have the same imperative uh, to really look look hard at our businesses and and make sure that they're sustainable and and make the changes that we need to make. Um, that's as one. I suppose I think two is. Um, you know the people who work in our businesses and the people who are connected whether they be they don't work for us directly or work with us and in, in a partnership I think we need to create the environment for um, everybody to be successful and that's really about empowerment uh, so I really like the idea of you know moving moving to a, a sort of meritocracy where we're looking at the, the, the work where you know it's coming towards us we're, we're applying a critical lens to it and then we're giving it a, a level of autonomy that uh, that's moving away from the hierarchical systems of businesses to move ahead and and uh, and prove yourself and deliver value and and be accountable to value as as our you know as articulated by our business and and, and allow a bit of and failure is part of that and um, so i think empowerment i think if we can we really need to focus hard on on how we're setting ourselves up um Brian, not to cut you there, but I'll let Jackie in. Well, I am cutting you at the time. That's fine. Okay. I, was, um, I was done. <laughs> Jackie, I'm probably down to one tip at this stage. And sure. guys, when you're thinking, Brian, you might shoot up your, your contact details if panelists want to contact you directly. Um, we're getting loads of, of great vibe there from chat and Q&A. Jackie. Um, thanks, Gornia. I'd say uh, just to, to, to be aware of the changing nature of the workforce ecosystem. So, um, and really kind of how kind of the gig economy is now kind of amplified to kind of freelancers, contractors, um, you know, full-time workers or otherwise, um, and kind of the role that kind of technology will play um, going forward around uh, and how we can kind of leverage that for the greater good longer term, i.e. telemedicine, for example. Um, and then I'd also say just um, culture and so connecting through purpose and engagement. So kind of maintaining engagement, connecting through purpose and maintaining um, culture um, over the long term. Super, Jackie. Thanks. And Charlie, last but not least, go for it. Just briefly, um, don't assume that your colleague's experience is the same as your own. Um, and also don't assume that just because you give somebody access to um, digital tools that they know how to use them. Fantastic. Guys, thanks so much. Um, I'm, I'm conscious um, the, the contact details are going up. The conversation will hopefully flow on, on Twitter. The DT Lab UCC can be found on Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn. Join the conversation, guys. Don't stop. Watch out for our August um, event. Thank you so much, Brian, Jackie and Charlie for taking you. your time out and um, sharing your insights today. And we look forward to future collaboration and we won't say goodbye and the story is ended only to continue. And indeed, thanks to all my team at DT Lab at UCC, Pody, our chairman, the lads for answering the questions and indeed the Cubs, the University Business School College for supporting us in our events. And we look forward to seeing you soon. 
thanks and stay safe and look forward to keeping the conversation going. DT Lab UCC. Thanks, Courtney. Thanks Thank so you much. very much. Thank you. Thanks, thanks guys. Thank you. Thank you.